Hello, and welcome, fellow enthusiasts of preventive medicine and the gastrointestinal metabolome. My name is David Quigg, and I am the Vice President of Scientific Support for Doctors Data Laboratory. Now, over the next 50 minutes or so, I will go into great depth regarding gastrointestinal permeability, its consequences and considerations for clinical intervention. Now, over the past two decades, we have learned so much about the central role of the gut in a vast array of diseases and sustained adverse health conditions. Now, over the past 10 years, phenomenal advances in technology have permitted cataloging of the millions of non-redundant genetic sequences that encode for the millions of bacteria that constitute what we know as the core gastrointestinal microbiome. Now, such voluminous genetic information will someday be clinically applicable. But to date, the biggest thing that we have learned from the gastrointestinal microbiome project is just how little we really do know about the gastrointestinal metabolome. Now, the metagenomic data has been in the spotlight at the expense of gastrointestinal metabolomics, especially the sorely overlooked gastrointestinal glycobiomics that is so very important in maintaining the gastrointestinal barriers as well as the commensal microflora contained within the bounds of the barrier system. And that barrier system is truly a remarkable ecosystem in and of itself. So today, I will specifically discuss the components of the intestinal barrier systems and the mechanisms for the incredible mutualistic relationship between the barriers and the microbiota. Now, when we think about the uh, gastrointestinal microbiome, we have to think about it as an ecosystem because any ecosystem is a complex network of interactions among and between organisms and their environment. And the beauty of this GI ecosystem is that the microbes themselves consuming uh, contents from the lumen uh, and from within the ecosystem are spitting out products that affect the barrier function, which is indicated by the frame around this beautiful picture. So the important thing is that the microbes are influencing the integrity of the intestinal barrier system. And in turn, the barrier system is protecting and serving a very useful function with respect to the microbiome and the inhabitants therein. It's a very mutualistic system. And we all remember the quote from Claude Bernard back in the 1800s, and that is, the germ is nothing, the terrain is everything. So we're talking about the terrain being the intestinal barrier system. Now, I found another quote much more recently that summed up that concept, um, and that is, to be or not to be a pathogen, that is the mucosally relevant question. And that will be obviated uh, by the following discussion. Now, when we talk about the gastrointestinal ecosystem, we consider the three uh, primary components the metabolome, that is the microbes, plus their collective metabolites, the terrain, the intestinal barriers, and very, very importantly, the gastrointestinal glycobiome, that is the study of the glycosylation uh, and glycation of proteins uh, and various components within the GI microbiome. Now, 
of pivotal importance in the gastrointestinal glycobiome are the mucins, which are highly glycosylated proteins that are constantly renewed. They are the primary molecules involved in host pathogen interaction. There are both secretory and non-secretory adherent mucins, both of which uh, form critical protective barrier layers. Now, the mucins are extremely dynamic and responsive to changing conditions in the microbiome. And to illustrate that, consider that during uh, infectious invasion, the glycosylation state of both the host and the pathogen change, which can affect the pathogenesis as well as the host's structural and immune responses. So to be covered today, we're going to talk about the intestinal barriers, that is with an S, their primary uh, components, uh, key regulatory factors in maintaining the intestinal barriers, including the grossly underappreciated Clostridium species, I'm going to talk about assessment of uh, key barrier components that can, information can be derived from a truly comprehensive stool analysis, looking at things like the specific bacteria, uh, butyrate, secretory IgA, and the inflammatory protein markers. Then I'll discuss direct assessment using a separate test that is the serum zonulin levels to assess the intestinal permeability of the epithelial cell layer. And then, of course, what most of you are primarily interested in is therapeutic support to maintain barrier integrity. Now, when we talk about intestinal permeability, we have to think about both transcellular and paracellular uh, influx of molecules. And I'm going to go into great detail in the delineation of the zonulin pathway that promotes increased permeability of the final epithelial cell barrier and the consequences of sustained epithelial barrier dysfunction. Breaches in barrier function or integrity are associated with a host of factors. Just some of those are listed here, including gut-derived protein fragments and lipopolysaccharides, uh, direct adhesion of bacteria to the endothelial cells, changes in the microbiome, and the metabolome induced by lifestyle and dietary factors, something your patients do have control over, pharmaceuticals, environmental xenobiotics that can affect epithelial damage, cancer treatments, particularly radiation, and excessive exercise with heat stress. Now, the intestinal barrier system is a huge, huge, multifactorial, layered, and highly integrated system that is a very high-maintenance system. It's been estimated that to maintain the integrity of the, mucose, of the intestinal barriers requires about 40% of our daily metabolic rate that is extremely energy-dependent. Now, the primary functions of the barrier systems are, of course, to regulate water and electrolyte balance, and very importantly, to prevent the influx of pathogens, toxicants, and antigens from the lumen of the gut. The barrier system regulates appropriate inflammatory and immune responses, and I emphasize appropriate because not all inflammation is bad. And this is very much a two-way two street in that there's incredible mutual regulation between the microbes and the barriers. That is, the commensal bacteria facilitate optimal status of the barrier components. In turn, the barrier components provide surveillance, protection, and selection 
of commensal bacteria and elimination of pathogens. Now, when we think about this multi-layered system, we think about three primary components. The first being the critical commensal bacteria and their metabolites. Secondly, we have the functional or functional chemical or biochemical barrier that includes digestive secretions, immune molecules such as secretory IgA and antimicrobial peptides, as well as inflammatory mediators like the cytokines. And then finally, we have the external physical barrier, which is of greatest interest to electrophysiologists who measure the epithelial um, permeability using the gold standard in vitro test known as TIER, which represents, stands for trans-epithelial electrical resistance. So we have the final physical barrier being the epithelial cell lining with its associated tight junctions. <clears throat> but very importantly, above that, we have a critical mucus gradient <clears throat> as well as the glycocalyx. And then underlying the physical barrier, we have the uh, lamina propria containing the immune system uh, of the gut as well as the vascular endothelium. Now, <clears throat> many people think about, when they think about leaky gut, a term that drives me crazy, they think only about epithelial barrier permeability, that is a breakdown of the tight junctions between the epithelial cells. But as you'll see as I proceed, there is much more to intestinal permeability than just increased gap junctions between the epithelial cells. So to get a better appreciation of these multi-layered uh, uh, barrier systems, let's take a look at the microbiology profile uh, for a 22-year-old female who unfortunately was given broad-spectrum antibiotics for a bad cold. She had no gastrointestinal symptoms, but developed arthritic-like pain and inflammation systemically in her hands and fingers. And this is a classic case of insufficiency dysbiosis, which I can't stress enough. And with insufficiency dysbiosis, we see no growth in this extreme case of bifidobacterium species, no growth of lactobacillus species, and very poor growth of uh, commensal enterococcus species and marginal growth of the commensal clostridium species. When this happens, with this loss of our key commensals, we get a compromised intestinal barrier system. That is primarily due to the decreased butyrate production by the commensals. And butyrate is a major messenger that communicates with the underlying components of the uh, endothelial cells and the barriers to produce um, and instigates microbial host crosstalk that influences the production and secretion of secretory IgA, antimicrobial peptides, mucus and mucin secretion, and when all these are decreased because of a lower production of butyrate, we see increased mucus and mucosal permeability. Now, when we have vacated adhesion sites by loss of these commensal and predominant beneficial bacteria, we get colonization and growth of uh, many uh, imbalanced flora. Most of these imbalanced flora are very benign. Uh, they can be extremely transient, here one day, gone the next. And some even have redu uh, properties that they, uh, redundant properties where they do things that some of the beneficial bacteria would do. But others are true pathobionts. That is, they have the potential to become pathogenic when the conditions are not good. 
And a case, an example of that would be Klebsiella pneumoniae, species pneumoniae, that is a gram-negative bacterium that's loaded with the lipopolysaccharide endotoxin, which is very pro-inflammatory. Now, such imbalances can cause gastrointestinal permeability and inflammation, as well as systemic problems such as inflammation and autoimmune reactions. <clears throat> now, to, I'm a very visual person, and to really uh, help comprehend what I just talked about, with respect to the role of the beneficial bacteria. Let's just take a look at the terrain, the different layers of the mucosal or the intestinal barriers. From the lumen, surrounded by a blanket of mucus, we have our first barrier. This mucus blanket um, towards the core of the lumen is much looser than the underlying, uh, more firm, adherent mucus blanket. Now, this outer loose uh, mucus barrier is where the uh, uh, pathogens uh, originally um, take place or, or reside. And fortunately, that outer loose mucus blanket is readily removed with a bowel movement or normal peristalsis activity. Then underlying the loose layer, we have the much denser inner firm, inner firm uh, adherent mucus barrier that harbors the commensal beneficial bacteria that, and also harbors the antimicrobial peptides, the, the protective reactive oxygen species, and very importantly, that's where secretory IgA resides. Interestingly, within this inner, uh, firm, more dense mucus blanket, we actually have a pH gradient that gets lower as we get near the surface of the endothelial cells. And as we all know, a lower pH is disfavorable for the growth of uh, pathogenic um, yeast species such as Candida albicans. So we have this mucus layer as the first component uh, of the intestinal barrier. And then we have a very, very important uh, glycocalyx, which includes membrane-tethered mucins that line the surface of the endothelial cells. Then we have the classic mucosal barrier that is composed of the epithelial cells and their tight junctions and endosomes. And then underlying the epithelial cell barrier, we have the uh, lamina propria, which is a, a connective tissue that is just loaded with immune cells, such as dendritic cells, T cells, macrophages, and lymphocytes. Now, these, uh, the lamina propria, uh, located cells produce reactive oxygen species and pro-inflammatory cytokines, and as does the uh, endothel as do the endothelial cells, which also produce the antimicrobial peptides and the secretory IgA. Now, the importance of this mucus blanket is illustrated uh, when we look at the literature in the case of ulcerative colitis patients, where they have a disrupted microbiome that results in decreased production of mucus, which results in increased permeability and pathogen colon colonization. So the mucus layer is incredibly important and sorely overlooked and is truly a component of the gastrointestinal glycobiome. And here's our friend mucus, just to emphasize the role of mucus. Fortunately, in our bodies, the mucus is not green. If you had green mucus in this mucus blanket, you'd be in a heap of trouble. Now, within the mucosal barrier, we have very specialized cells that are uh, responsible for sensing, reporting, and secreting. 
that is through the communication with the toll-like receptors, the PNF cells produce um, uh, alpha defensins, Reg3 proteins, and lysozyme, which is a glycosidic antibacterial enzyme that can be measured in comprehensive stool analysis. Then we have the goblet cells that produce the mucus and the critical mucins contained within that fluid matrix. And then, of course, the intraepithelial lymphocytes that also produce key antimicrobial peptides such as beta defensins and Reg3. Then, of course, from the blood, we have IgA that within the enterocytes is dimerized or conjugated to form uh, secretory IgA, which is an absolute brick in the intestinal barrier. But my very most favorite cells are the dendritic cells, because these dendritic cells uh, have these um, long dendritic feet, that extend up through pores in specialized M cells and actually sample bacterium from the surface of the glycocalyx, bring it back, the bacteria back down, and present it to the immune system, and for a yay or nay tolerance or mount a, an immune attack or response. So these dendritic cells have very important surveillance and reporter functions. So we have this finely tuned network of immune mechanisms for microbial recognition, selection, and eradication. Now we've been looking at the epithelial lining as a linear surface, and we all know that that's not the case. We have this tremendous amount of convolutions uh, within the uh, intestines of the villi, such that we have a huge, huge surface area. And if you look closely, you can see that on the villi are the single cell layer thick um, uh, tissue that is the endothelial cells. And these are specialized columnar-like epithelial, epithelial type cells. And when I look at uh, cartoons or pictures of the uh, enterocytes and these epithelial cells, I can't help but think of one of my favorite cartoon characters, and that would be uh, Mr. Bart Simpson. And I say that because you can see his sporty, microvillus-like hairdo that's formed by applying a thick, viscous gel, which is analogous with the glycocalyx. Then we notice that he has eyes and a nose that can be analogous to the reporter function, sensing and his mouth being the reporter function. So his eyes, nose, and mouth being responsible for sensing and reporting what's going on in the gastrointestinal tract. Also, if you really use your imagination, you can see those little itty-bitty ears that might be um, imagined or pictured to be analogous to the tight junction proteins that hold these columnar epithelial cells together to prevent the influx of macromolecules. Now, mucins are absolutely essential for the integrity of gut barrier functions. And mucins are highly glycosylated proteins that form polymers via their sulfhydryl binding, via their cysteine residues. And these polymers form a gel-like network. And I emphasize gel-like because we not only have these cross-linked polymers, but due to the high glycan content of these glycosylated proteins, they, uh, these nets attract a lot of water. So it's a viscous, pillowy-like uh, network that has physioelastic properties.
And analogous to that, just think about glycogen. Uh, for each mole of glycogen in our body, we, um, we attract seven moles of water. So hence the, um, the gel-like um, network. Now, as far as mucins go, we have secretory uh, mucins that constitute the viscous mucus barrier and also cell-bound non-secretory uh, mucins that form the glycocalyx. And that glycocalyx has a, a very important role as being adhesion sites for the binding of bacteria as well as being a critical barrier for protecting the underlying uh, endothelial cells. So mucins are to endothelial cells as biofilm is to bacteria and yeast. Mucins prevent direct bacterial binding to endothelial cells. Any kind of bacteria binding directly to endothelial cells really ticks them off and instigates a cascade of pro-inflammatory response. Now, the mucins are regulated by the commensal um, bacteria within the mucosa versus the lumen. That is, we have mucin harvesting specialist species of bacteria that release the glycans from the glycosylated proteins, the mucins, which causes, and by fermentation taken up um, by other commensal bacteria, produce butyrate, and that butyrate is signals back to increase the production of mucin. So we have breakdown of the uh, proteoglycans to produce butyrate, which feeds back for the system to produce more mucin. Now with obesity and a high fat, particularly high saturated fat diets, we see decreased mucus thickness and an increased inflammatory state associated with increased permeability. Now we can also have butyrate formed and feedback on mucin production with exogenous prebiotics, that is the um, soluble um, fiber derived from diet, the oligosaccharides, which increase mucin-stimulating bacteria. And these prebiotics, I'm very much a food person, uh, can be obtained from foods like onions, garlic, asparagus, and leeks, foods that children just love to eat as well as yams, chicory root, agave, bananas, and the root type, uh, Jerusalem artichoke. So just to, to get a better idea about what these mucins look like, we have the uh, secretory mucins, like MUC2, being released uh, from the uh, goblet cells. And these, this MUC2 has uh, repeating segments of uh, amino acids that are highly um, composed of serine and threonine. And that's where the glycans bind and form this fuzzy, like, water-attracting network. Then we have the non-secretory mucins, like MUC1, which forms that adherent gel barrier that protects the delicate epithelial cell. And you can see here it has a transmembrane protein um, foot that extends into the endothelial cell and may have some reporter function. Now, just to recap the microbial host mucin cycle, Mucin is the host prebiotic. So we have this protective mucus layer at the epithelial interface that is constantly reshaped and refreshed. It's been estimated that we produce about six liters of uh, in uh, mu uh, mucus in the intestines per day, and the resonant time of that mucus or those mucins is on the order of only four to six hours, hence the high maintenance of that critical uh, mucus barrier. Now, the glycoprotein content of the mucin harbor and feed 
symbionts and a consortium of mucin degrading specialists within the inner mucus layer release the glycans that are fermented by other commensal bacteria that crank out the butyrate. And that butyrate is critical for uh, microbial host crosstalk that stimulates mucin production and regulates immune and function and inflammation. So it fortifies the mucosal barrier. Now, a key component of the commensal bacteria occupying that key real estate on the glycocalyx is the grossly misunderstood Clostridium species. They are absolutely critical for the maintenance of the uh, mucus barrier. Yes, there are five truly pathogenic species of Clostridium, but they only constitute at most a point squat fraction of total Clostridium, even in the case of C. difficile associated disease. In fact, about 5% of total microbes within that key real estate, that specific position on the glycocalyx that facilitate continuous crosstalk with the mucosa are in fact Clostridium species. Now, the, the commensal Clostridium species are key components in the regulation of barrier homeostasis mostly because uh, that they are major butyrate producers and initiate that host crosstalk. We see a decreased abundance of Clostridium species in colorectal cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. Juxtapose, we see increased abundance of Clostridium species, that is the commensal species, uh, in association with the consumption of a high fiber diet, uh, particularly consuming high amounts of fruit, vegetables, and beans. The most impressive thing about the Clostridium species that I hope will convince you that they are not all bad is the fact that during the first uh, month of life, we see colonization of commensal Clostridium species in the guts of breastfed infants, okay? That's pretty important. And that's, that occurs through vertical transfer. That is transfer of the, the commensal clostridium from mom's breast milk to infants. And in a fascinating study published in the pediat pediatric research uh, last year, there was a human study of seven moms and their infants. And they did microbial analysis of mom's breast milk and the microbial analysis of both the maternal and infant feces. And what they found was that in addition to the majority genera of the bifidobacterium, there was also um, transfer of commensal clostridium species such as C. blauti, colancella, and Vilanella. So what we have here is um, commensal clostridium species from the maternal gut being taken up, transferred into mom's lymph, into mom's breast milk, and finally into the gut of the suckling infant. And the mechanism, again, is my favorite cells, the dendritic cells with their dendritic feet that actually reach up and sample the clostridia from the glycocalyx, bring it down, transfer it into the lymph where it is then transported to the breast milk. A truly, truly phenomenal system that really emphasizes the importance of commensal clostridium species. Now, we can't have any discussion about the integrity of the intestinal barrier system without detailed discussion of the short-chain fatty acids, which are, of course, produced by fermentation of the mucin-derived glycans, as well as soluble dietary fiber by the commensal bacteria.
Those short chain fatty acids, of course, are primarily butyrate, acetate, and propionate. These short chain fatty acids are fuel for enterocytes and many other tissues. And butyrate, in particular, increases the uh, mast cell serotonin release. And the short-chain fatty acids are essential for maintenance of mucin and barrier function. Now, butyrate uh, mediates what I've been referring to as microbial host crosstalk. That is, the host listens to butyrate produced by the commensals. And that happens through uh, G protein coupled receptors that are located on immune and epithelial cells. The butyrate mediates the production of mucins, antimicrobial peptides, and the release of anti-inflammatory cytokines by the epithelial cells. Now, butyrate is taking up, taken up very rapidly from the gut, and that which is not used by the enterocytes or endothelial cells in fact, crosses uh, into systemic circulation and even crosses the blood-brain barrier where it can ameliorate neuroinflammation. And, of course, short-chain fatty acids are significantly affected by dietary soluble fiber as well as the gut-derived uh, mucins. Now, Fecalobacterium prosnitzi and some Clostridia clusters are major butyrate producers located in that prime real estate in close proximity to the endothelial cells. And these species are far more abundant in diets that contain chickpeas and raffinose. Now, we also can't talk about the intestinal barrier system without a thorough discussion of secretory IgA, which is the absolute brick in the mucus barrier. Secretory IgA is anchored in the viscous mucus and on the epithelial cells, where it provides immune exclusion of microbes, including viruses, and also toxins produced by bacteria. The binding of secretory IgA to pathogens alters their membrane potentials, which decreases their ability to make ATP, which causes them to have a loss of mobility or motility, and very importantly, impairs their ability to produce the important protective biofilm. Remember, all bacteria and yeast produce the protective biofilm. Secretory IgA is also an anti-inflammatory immunoglobulin in that it neutralizes the lipopolysaccharide endotoxin in the apical recycling endosomes. So it abrogates the um, NF-kappa-B pro-inflammatory signaling. It also augments uh, antiparasitic activity via activation of eosinophils, and it regulates the composition of the microbiota, just like the dendritic cells, in that it provides constant surveillance, sampling, and communication with the underlying immune cells. Secretory IgA from maternal milk initiates immune training, that is, with vaginal birth, and also uh, initiates uh, and propagates epithelial maturation in the infants. And as we have discussed in a previous seminar, a chronic candidiasis is often associated with very low secretory IgA, despite normal serum IgA levels. And that's because candida species in particular produce a secretory IgA-specific protease enzyme. So intervention for low secretory IgA, we never want to see low secretory IgA uh, in a comprehensive stool analysis. To support low secretory IgA, we can use the omega-3 and other short-chain fatty acids 
olive oil, zinc, vitamin D, and vitamin A. Probiotics, it's very important to examine the strains of the probiotic species. When we look in the literature, we see that Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG and Bifidobacterium lactis BB12 increase the number of secretory IgA secreting cells in formula-fed infants. And then we're all familiar with bona fide Saccharomyces boulardii uh, being a very potent stimulator of secretory IgA. Also prebiotics uh, from vegetables, fruits, chickpeas, beans, uh, glutamine, uh, arginine because of its production of nitric oxide, but do be mindful if, of the many patients that have herpes, arginine is not good to give to people with the herpes virus. Now, juxtaposed, stress really trashes secretory IgA activity. That's emotional or physical stress knocks out secretory IgA production and secretion. So in patients with low secretory IgA on a stool analysis, do consider evaluation of salivary cortisol and even DHEA. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the essential role of vitamin D in gastrointestinal restoration and health. The vitamin D receptor, VDR, signaling turns off chronically active T cells. This results in decreased mucosal inflammation it decreases T cell proliferation and its inflammatory cytokine production and enhances the expression of those wonderful endothelial cell tight junction proteins. We're going to talk more about those in a second. So vitamin D influences the microbiome and the barrier system integrity by regulation of antimicrobial peptides and facilitates mu mucosal barrier homeostasis and colonic epithelial healing. So don't forget vitamin D as well as A, but make sure you're not overwhelming or causing an imbalance of D to A. Um, now, when we talk about breaching the epithelial barriers, um, we talk about finally we're down to the epithelial layer, the epithelial cell physical barrier. And here we have transcellular uh, movement of things like electrolytes, B12, amino acids, sugars, short chain fatty acids through receptor mediated processes, that is transcellular as opposed to paracellular transport of um, molecules uh, such as water and small solutes, that is through the pores of the tight junction proteins. That's very normal. So with a normal mucus barrier, we have a nice amount of secretory IgA and commensal bacteria and a good healthy um, transcellular as well as blockage of paracellular influx of pro-inflammatory mediators. However, when we have a damaged or compromised mucosal layer, we see decreased secretory IgA, decreased commensal bacteria, and an increased presence of pathobionts or even pathogens. This results in not only increased paracellular transport via breakdown of the tight junction protein complex between these cells, but also an increase in the transcellular influx of things that we don't want to get in. This results in pro-inflammatory signaling both in the GI tract and tissue damage as well as systemic pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine release. So the final cellular barrier, what everyone has referred to in the past as leaky gut. And this entails the zonulin-induced permeability of the epithelium. Now the tight junctions uh, between the epithelial cells are very dynamic and interconnected protein networks that regulate paracellular influx
of macromolecules for all epithelial cells in the body. So not only in the gut, but also in the um, arterial endothelium uh, in the heart, as well as in the brain, the blood-brain barrier. So zonulin is currently the only known physiological reversible modulator of these intercellular tight junctions, these TJ protein complexes. Now, we do have transient, very transient, reversible opening and closing of these um, uh, tight junctions. And that occurs as a defensive mechanism. And as explained by Dr. Alessio Fasano, this permits an influx of bacteria that facilitates a very robust uh, immune response. That is, with a bacterial flush, we expose the underlying immune system to that uh, undesirable bacteria that helps us have a very, very powerful immune response. Then there is closing of the tight junctions. However, with sustained um, breakdown of the tight junctions, we see, um, as we see with high serum zonulin levels, it's associated with autoimmune diseases such as celiac, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 autoimmune diabetes, as well as cancers such as gliomas, breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancers, and problems in the nervous system, uh, such as demyelinating polyneuropathy, multiple sclerosis, schizophrenia, and even juvenile fatty liver disease, which is uh, all too prevalent in North America in our chubby little adolescents that are not running around, um, and also asthma and metabolic syndrome. So a breakdown of the uh, epithelial cell barrier has significant consequences. Now, the, um, the gliadin-induced zonulin pathway uh, and the associated increased permeability, uh, this whole pathway has been very eloquently been delineated by Dr. Fasano and his group. And the story goes something like this. A trigger, gliadin peptides, bind to a chemokine receptor called CXCR3. Now, CXCR3, the chemokine receptor, and zonulin are significantly overexpressed in patients with celiac disease. And when the gliadin binds to this chemokine receptor, it activates the release of zonulin, in the case of celiac disease, excess amounts of zonulin from the enterocyte and that zonulin molecule is then binds to two key receptors on the surface of endothelial cells, the protein activating receptor 2 and also transactivation of the epidermal growth factor. When these uh, receptors are bound uh, by zonulin or about to zonulin, it activates a cascade of proteolytic events that tear down these wonderful tight junction proteins and leave us with a big gap between the enterocytes such that macromolecules can now leak through the system from the lumen. So when this happens, we have activation of the immune system uh, the immune system responds with pro-inflammatory cytokines that can cause tissue damage not only in the GI tract, as is the case with celiac disease, but it can also attack the beta cells in the pancreas and cause autoimmune type 1 diabetes. Now, there is some hope. Um, for blocking the zonulin pathway, and I will discuss that in detail in just a moment. Now, this whole issue of gluten sensitivity got out of hand for a while. It was debated that there was really no such thing, and this was just a fad, but it's clearly not a fad, as I will show you some data. <clears throat> 
to dispel that myth. And in a recent uh, article published in Gastroenterology, a statement was made that when people with gastrointestinal diseases <clears throat> such as celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or irritable bowel syndrome, when they consume gluten proteins, they can become, quote, sick. Now, in, a, uh, in research that was recently published at a national microbiology meeting, uh, Dr. Barbaro produced evidence to show that levels of zonulin in serum were significantly elevated in celiac disease patients, also elevated but to a lesser extent in non-celiac gluten-sensitive patients. And there was also a trend for an elevation in zonulin in patients with IBS. That was not statistically significant. However, a very important follow-up study showed that the uh, zonulin response and increased permeability can be greatly ameliorated uh, with a gluten-free diet, gluten being a primary trigger of the zonulin pathway. So um, they looked at zonulin levels, that is the serum antigen levels of zonulin uh, in patients with celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, IBS, and IBDs before and after a gluten-free diet. And the results were very interesting. After the gluten-free diet, um, for IBD patients, there was no significant effect of the gluten-free diet on their markedly elevated serum zonulin levels. So clearly gluten or gliadin was not a trigger in IBD. As expected, in celiac patients, the gluten-free diet was associated with a marked decrease in serum zonulin and decrease antibody titers for the markers of tissue damage, that being tissue transglutaminase and deaminated gliadin peptide, both IgA and IgG. For the non-celiac gluten-sensitive patients, the gluten-free diet was also associated with decreased zonulin and antibodies against the uh, gliadin um, peptides. Now, interestingly, in the IBS type D patients, there was a greater decrease in zonulin in subjects that had the genetic predisposition for celiac, and that would be the double HLA-DQ2 or DQ8 alleles. So the conclusion from this study was that a gluten-free diet can be beneficial to patients who have elevated levels of serum zonulin and, in fact, experience reactions to gluten. And many times people don't know that they're having a reaction to gluten, such as, you know, joint pain. Oh, I'm just getting older. So this, this, this measurement of serum zonulin might be very helpful uh, in motivating these people to get off of gluten. So zonulin is a, a very uh, useful clinical diagnostic marker of intestinal permeability. Increased serum zonulin levels, that is the antigen, uh, indicate increased permeability of the endothelial cell barrier. Um, increased zonulin levels are correlated highly with the gold standard in vitro assessment of epithelial permeability, and that is the trans-epithelial electrical resistance. And zon increased zonulin levels are correlated to some extent with an abnormal ratio of lactulose mannitol. However, Serum zonulin clearly supplants the lactulose mannitol test because of the small size of the lactulose molecule, only 342 molecular weight, precludes definitive information about the influx of antigenic uh, and pro-inflammatory macromolecules. So what are some of the triggers for increased zonulin and increased uh, epithelial cell permeability? Obviously, gliadin, 
I talked about direct adherence of bacterial uh, bacteria to the epithelial cells independent of their virulence. We can't even have lactobacilli binding directly to epithelial cells. Also bacterial uh, lipopolysaccharide endotoxin and other bacterial enterotoxins and proteases, corticosteroids, pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, and dietary protein fragments, and maybe, just maybe, food additives such as the abundant microbial transglutaminase, fructose emulsifiers, and salt, as well as nanoparticles. And I say maybe because to date, uh, and, uh, evidence to suggest that these are true triggers only comes from epidemiological studies and some scant data from animal studies. This is a brand new uh, area of research and surely we'll be uh, hearing about other triggers for activating the xenon pathway uh, very shortly. So proof of concept that disruption of the xenon pathway can be beneficial was um, offered by a, a very eloquent study um, in a uh, rat model. And basically what we're talking about is increased permeability of the small bowel preceding the onset of diabetes and pancreatic islet destruction in rats by about a month and humans by uh, years. That is, we see increased zonulin in serum um, up to three and a half years prior to the onset of type 1 uh, autoimmune uh, diabetes. So in a rat study of a genetically engineered uh, rat model, the bio-breeding diabetic prone rats that develop type 1 diabetes within 100, about, 100, or about 80 days uh, from birth. And what they did was they took uh, half of these uh, rats and they used a um, a peptide um, a molecule that blocks the binding of zonulin to the epithelial cells that instigates the breakdown of the tight junctions. And when they administered this agent, this synthetic peptide, it caused blockage of the zonulin binding to the enterocytes and prevented the zonulin-induced intestinal permeability insulitis and decrease the incidence of diabetes in these genetically prone rats by 70 percent despite markedly increased uh, levels of luminal zonulin. So even though the zonulin pathway was being activated, blocking zonulin at the surface of the epithelial cells uh, precluded uh, the breakdown or uh, eliminated the breakdown of the tight junction barrier proteins. Now, random double-blind placebo-controlled trials of celiac disease patients uh, indicate that this synthetic peptide that blocks the zonulin binding was very well tolerated. It blocked an increased intestinal permeability and greatly ameliorated GI symptoms, as well as lowered TNF gamma levels after a 14-day gluten challenge. Imagine taking celiac patients and uh, subjecting them to uh, gluten. Now, this synthetic peptide has been trademarked as lorazotide, and it's been tested for safety and tolerance in um, uh, over 500 patients at this point in time. So clinical intervention to normalize zonulin. Uh, sorry, folks, the, it's like any other environmental issue. Uh, we have to eliminate the triggers. And unfortunately, we don't know what all those triggers are. We know what some of them are. Um, but short of eliminating the triggers, we have a plethora of research that indicates that we can at least support the expression of the tight junction proteins using specific probiotics, prebiotics, glutamine, tryptophan, curcumin, vitamin D, and retinol, quercetin, genistein, 
gamma linoleic acid and believe it or not, a beta casein peptide. We do know that chitosan, which is ground up crab shells, which is a very abundant food additive, and ethanol actually decrease the expression of the tight junction proteins. Now, I'm not saying that simply increasing the expression of the tight junction proteins will, um, will prevent the increased gaps between the endothelial cells. I think that even if we do that, if we don't eliminate the triggers, we're still going to have a problem. But at least we can export, uh, support the expression of these proteins in the healing process as we eliminate the triggers. So my takeaway points are that the gastrointestinal barrier is a very complex ecosystem of resident symbionts, resident and recruited immune cells, and a very responsive mucus layer. The first line mucus barrier harbors commensals and immune components that support the barrier, and the barrier in turn supports the commensals. Endothelial cell membrane-bound mucins, the glycocalic, serve as adhesion sites for bacteria and protect and communicate with the epithelium. Mucus and its mucins are dynamic and affected by symbionts and pathogens, and there is effective clinical intervention to support the mucins, and such intervention should be considered as part of any and every gut restoration protocol. Zonulin is a reversible physiological regulator of endothelial cell tight junctions, that is the permeability of the epithelium. Persistent activation of the zonulin pathway predisposes individuals to inflammatory, autoimmune, and even neoplastic disorders, disorders as well as non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Elucidation of the zonulin pathway has facilitated the, the development of a superior diagnostic marker of intestinal permeability uh, to pro-inflammatory and antigenic macromolecules. Serum zonulin levels can be used serially, serially to monitor your clinical interventions to restore epithelial barrier function. There's been a lot of material presented here. Um, I would encourage you to view this material um, a couple of times. And if you have any uh, questions uh, or need any additional information, please contact us at inquiries at doctorsdata.com. And I thank you kindly for your attention and your very good intentions. Cheers.